Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 14 tonight for our study in 1 Corinthians. According to your outline, this is a study on the gifts of tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. Now, we probably could say, well, we could just skip chapter 14, but really, I think we'd be the worse off we did because even though we practice these three utterance gifts, he deals with more than three. It's interesting that in this section that the non-charismatic writers and commentators limit the regulations of Paul to speaking in tongues. But it's interesting that there are many kinds of utterances here that he regulates or says it should be dealt with in the service. Now, chapter 14 is not introducing a new subject. Remember, we said he didn't write in chapters, so we go back to 12, the diversities of operations of the gifts. Chapter 13 would be how to minister the gifts in love. Chapter 14, he deals exclusively with utterances. And, of course, that leaves out gifts that are not of the nature of an utterance. And there are more utterances in the church than just tongues, interpretation, and prophecy. As we shall see, several kinds he mentions here and says they ought to be regulated. So chapter 14 will be Paul's instructions for the use of the utterance gifts and other forms of utterance, as well as his corrective of any, well, misuse. Now, what may have happened here, you know you've read the chapter, and we will be reading it, where he deals with uninterpreted tongues in the public meeting. And I've tried to picture in my mind what may have happened. I don't know what you think about it, but I'm not persuaded that just everyone stood up and started taking turns and speaking in tongues without interpretation. I think what happened is that while he points out in chapter 12, not all have the gift of divers kinds of tongues, obviously. Yet everyone, every charismatic, spirit-filled Christian can speak in tongues. And so when they got together with this glorious experience of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, and it's still glorious after you've had it for years, this supernatural ability just to praise God or speak forth in a language you've never learned. And so probably what they did, it wasn't just the tongues, but you had somebody over here prophesying and about six over here singing in the Spirit and somebody over here prophesying and people all over the place speaking in their, well, what could be called devotional tongues, you know, the sign of tongues or the evidence of the baptism, which every charismatic Christian can speak in tongues, but only a small percentage of all who receive would have the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. And so they were just getting together and all sorts of utterances were coming forth, revelations, visions, and some were trying to teach because he deals with that a little later in the chapter showing that there's a place for everything. So I say there are many utterances besides the one that's always dealt with by the commentaries. And so the gift of tongues, unlike devotional tongues, which are for your personal edification, the gift of tongues is for our edification. And that's why that people should not be giving forth utterances unless they interpret. Not, it wasn't, I don't believe, just occasionally somebody would come forth with an utterance and not interpret, wait for somebody else to do it, but that they were just all enjoying the blessing of the anointing of the Holy Spirit. I just think at Corinth, well, he says in chapter 1, they come behind in no gift, and when they got together, everyone just started exercising his gift. See, I can just stop right now, English, and start praying in the Spirit, and I'm going to get blessed. Won't help you any. But see, you don't do that. But I think that's what they were doing. They were just getting together, and one would be half through his vision he had, his revelation, and somebody else over here would start prophesying, and you'd have three or four prophets prophesying at once because he says, you prophets take your turn too, you know, by turn speak. So obviously they weren't taking their turns. Well, be that as it may, I think that's probably what was happening. But because he insists that we interpret why, as so we'll point out later, this does not mean we can't all pray together in the Spirit. 
because we already know God has confirmed that so many times that we can pray together about a need or a matter in the Spirit and that it has power that one individual would not have. There are just some times when the whole army has to concentrate its forces on one threat by the enemy. And while ordinarily one sniper or one machine gunner or one tank can take care of a situation, there are times when you have to forget everything else and move in and concentrate on a certain position to take it. Well, you'll excuse the expressions to soldiering, but Paul uses it and Jesus even uses examples. The point being that God has shown us, even in vision, that there's power praying together in the Spirit where one may not get the job done. Well, you don't interpret that. We'd be here all week. What did you say when you were coming against that cancer spirit? The first time that we ever did this, I remember years ago, I was impressed to ask the church just to kneel down. That's when we were small. Well, we could still do it, but anyway, it was a small house church, about 40 or 50, I guess, maybe even 30. And so we were to pray for a certain sister that needed deliverance, and we were dealing with her individually, but the job wasn't getting done. So we prayed and interceded in the Spirit, and this was our first vision in the church. We were quite new in the charismatic experience. The vision that was given was here was the woman standing who needed deliverance badly from demons. And as we prayed in the Spirit, in tongues, if you please, without interpretation, this was intercession in the Spirit. It was like she was enclosed in a glass shield, you know, bulletproof shield, and the demons with their claws and all were reaching out, but they could only come as far as, well, where the glass was, and they couldn't get beyond it. And then as we continued to pray, they backed off more and more and disappeared. So let the non-charismatics, or even some charismatics, say you ought to always interpret. They don't know anything about the power of prayer in the Spirit when the church prays. And it's been confirmed so many times. Well, that doesn't take interpretation. And then singing in the Spirit. When we're all anointed to sing in perfect harmony and pitch, and everyone, no doubt, has a different language, if there's 1,500, 2,000, that's about two-thirds of the possibilities. There are 2,800 living and dead languages. I don't think any of us are duplicating each other. If we did, that's all right, but it wouldn't be the majority. It's interesting, though, that most of what, if you pick up to read anything about the utterance gifts, especially tongues interpretation, most of what you read is written by non-charismatics. I still think it's a better part of wisdom that if you're going to write on a subject, you know something about it. <laughs> If they're going to tell us what Paul really meant in 12 to 14, I think they ought to get Paul's experience first, which was the baptism of the Holy Spirit, because he said, I pray in tongues more than all of you put together. And they're going to tell us tongues are the least gift and demean them and all of that. No. As I said previously, I found without exception, whenever a non-charismatic writes on charismatic subjects, he ends up putting his foot in his mouth. I read one commentator, I've got a few things jotted down here that will edify you. <laughs> edify you in that you know better. Paul shows us here that the gift of sacred preaching is superior to speaking in tongues. Well, I've searched that whole chapter and I can't find the sacred preaching <laughs> that he compares it to. And then, of course, you really know what they're talking about. They have reduced prophecy, which is an anointing by the Spirit, comes by inspiration and or revelation, to preparation, you know, to stand up and teach people. Now, I'm not demeaning that. That's certainly one of the gifts, and it's the most necessary one to be exercised, the teaching of the Word. But he has reduced prophecy to preaching. And as we pointed out before, the two terms are never confused in the New Testament. They're two different terms, and the writers never confuse them, though the preachers generally do today. And another, I think I quoted this to you in another connection earlier in this study. Tongues on the day of Pentecost were true languages in chapter 14 in the church at Corinth that was unintelligible ecstatic outbursts. Now, it doesn't seem to bother these writers that there's not a word in the Bible to justify their position this nonsense we could call it, but they go right on and do it anyway. Another said, and you'll enjoy this one, speaking in tongues results in embarrassment, 
<laughs> confusion, disorder, and disgust among non-charismatic observers. I'm sure it sometimes does because it seems like I read somewhere in the New Testament, to be precise, it's Acts 2, that this was the exact reaction of the skeptics on the day of Pentecost, disgust, and accuse them of being drunk, drunk on new wine. So what's new? Skeptics always react that way. You could stand up here and speak a language you learned, and if they thought it was tongues, and maybe their old daddy spoke it, you know, came over from Germany, and you'd speak a little in German, or from Israel, and you'd speak a little in Hebrew, but they didn't know enough to recognize it. If they thought it was tongues, they would despise it. It's interesting, the same people who do that, churches are filled with those kind of people who are critical of tongues, and after all, Acts 2 shows you their languages. The same people, though, will think nothing uh, playing with a Ouija board and communicating with spirits they can't see, which we know to be demons. They will go to seances and communicate with what they think is the dead. I'm talking about people in the churches. Now, I pray for too many for deliverance for you to think this is some exception of some way out Catholic church or whatever else you might think off the beaten path of the word. I'm talking about Presbyterians, Baptists, Methodists, you name it. I really haven't met anybody yet that wasn't somehow involved in the occult. So they'll go to seances and fortune tellers and see Hollywood movies like The Exorcist and on and on and on. They'll search out demonic contacts and spirit voices, but run for the nearest exit. When there's a manifestation of the Holy Spirit from heaven, they'll say, oh, they're in league with the devil. They're mad. Well, let's look at this chapter. I'm going to divide it into subjects because he treats various ideas. The first five verses, he shows the comparative advantage of being understood when you speak so that the church can be edified as against simply edifying yourself when you speak. And you can edify yourself, he shows and no one else. So follow after love and desire spiritual gifts. We could remind them that that's what he said, desire them, but rather that you prophesy. For he that speaks in a tongue speaks not unto men, but unto God, for no man understands him. Unless he would happen to speak that language, but you know that generally isn't the case. Howbeit in the Spirit he speaks mysteries. But he that prophesies speaks unto the church, or unto men, to edification, exhortation, and comfort. He that speaketh in a tongue edifies himself. Now, isn't that interesting? He said he does edify himself. Hey, non-charismatic writers, commentators, speaking in tongues, we edify ourselves. But you want to edify more than yourself? Then he says prophesy, because that will edify the church because they understand the language. Then he said, I would that you all spake with tongues. How about that? Non-charismatics. He would that you all spake with tongues. He doesn't demean or despise them, but rather that you prophesy, for greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks with tongues. Now that's where they get that idea that tongues is the least of the gifts. They're always telling us, you know, prophesy, prophesy, speaking in tongues is the least of the gifts. Well, that isn't what he said in the first place. When anyone has ever said that to me, I ask them, are you prophesying in your church? Does your church prophesy? That stops it right there. Except for those who are already clued in on the commentaries interpretation of prophecy. They'll say, oh yes, that's when the pastor preaches. He's prophesying. I mean, that's common. But he doesn't say that greater is he that prophesies than he that speaks in tongues and puts a period there. The commentators put the period. What did he say? He said he's greater if he prophesies in the known language that the people understand than he that speaks in a tongue they don't know except he interpret. And then if he interprets, he says the church will receive edifying. Except he interprets so the church can be edified. In other words, Prophecy, 
or tongues with interpretation are equivalent. They're not the same or you wouldn't need three gifts. It will edify the church. Tongues with interpretation edifies the church. That's why we don't apologize for it here. So before you attempt to interpret chapter 14, get the baptism. Secondly, hear what Paul has to say through this section. He was writing on one subject, gifts. In verse 31 of 12, he said, Covet earnestly the best gifts. 14.1, follow after love and desire the spiritual gifts. Verse 12, you should be zealous for spiritual gifts. He says that will edify the church. Verse 39, covet to prophesy and forbid not to speak with tongues. Now he said all that before you try to interpret what Paul said. You better see what he did say. And I've not read a commentator or a book that ever bothers to see what Paul said. Moreover, speaking in tongues is not belittled by the apostle, even though all of the books by non-charismatics demean and belittle speaking in tongues. Paul doesn't do it. Look at these verses again. He says, if you speak in tongues, you're speaking mysteries directly to God. Now, I don't know about you, but that really blesses me. That when I pray in the Spirit, I'm not talking about now with interpretation for the edification of the church. When I pray in the Spirit, the deep mysteries that my mind probably couldn't even comprehend. If all of a sudden it came out English, I doubt if I could comprehend. Well, many times, because these are mysteries. So when you pray in the Spirit, He doesn't say, don't do that because you don't know what you might be saying. Well, you do know what you're saying in the sense that you're speaking the deep mysteries of the Spirit to God. Verse 4, let's say what Paul said. If you speak in tongues, you do edify yourself without interpretation. It edifies you. That's why later he goes on to say, if you are not going to interpret, speak to yourself and God. He doesn't say, wait till you get home or out in the car. He says, go right on speaking in tongues, but silently. Now, if you don't know how to pray silently in English or in the Spirit... Well, I can't help you. <laughs> I can stop right now and pray for an hour and never move my lips in the Spirit. Try it with your understanding and then just move on into tongues and you'll see it does work. Amen. But he goes on to say, pray to yourself in God. If you're so anointed, then you don't have the gift of interpretation or you would be out of order, interrupt someone else with your tongues and we see your head bowed and your lips moving 100 miles an hour, we'll probably not have to investigate, see what you're doing. We'll just assume there's a brother, sister anointed and they're praying in the Spirit. Maybe praying for me. Praise God. Go ahead. <laughs> and then verse 5, he says, he wishes they all speak in tongues. Let's say what Paul said. Let's stay honest. Then he says, tongues with interpretation is equivalent to prophecy, verse 5. Verse 12, he says, since you're zealous for spiritual gifts, seek that you may excel to the edifying the church. And so that's why he says in verse 13, that if you speak in a tongue, then pray that you may interpret, so the church will be edified. But he says, excel in your gift. You've got to practice to excel. You don't learn how with your intellect. But a person with the gift of tongues will hear himself or herself moving out of one language into another. But if you don't pray in the Spirit, how could you excel? And so you feel an anointing or experience an anointing, and you get up and somebody says, well, that's that devotional tongues. I've heard him pray, you know, just to the Lord when we're praying to the Lord. I thought he had the gift of tongues. It's because he's not seeking to excel. Because as you pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit will move you out of one language into another. One time I just started counting them. I think I quit at 10, 10 languages. I had claimed the gift of divers' tongues, and 10 was enough to convince me. <laughs> Verse 18, he says, I thank God. Now, I want you to notice he's not ashamed. Like some charismatics who get the baptism... They don't want anybody to know it, husband, wife, family, or friends. Well, maybe they didn't even get it. But anyway, he's not ashamed. I thank God 
And he's making a public statement. This is going to go all over the world. What's he thanking God for? That I speak in tongues. I want you to know I thank God I speak in tongues. Outside salvation, it's the greatest thing that's happened to me. The baptism of the Holy Spirit and the evidence of speaking in new tongues. I'll tell you, I think I said last Wednesday, one of the things I want to thank the Father for is baptizing me in the Holy Spirit and having the supernatural enabling to speak these various languages of worship and praise. And sometimes it's rebuke of the devil. It can bring deliverance, tongues can, or healing. It's not just to praise God in, but sometimes that's the way you effectively go against Satan. So I think God, he says, I speak in tongues more than you all. They spoke in tongues so much, he had to put some regulations in here. Of course, he does for the other utterances too, but that's a big statement. I speak in tongues more than you all. I don't know where he meant all put together or more than anybody in that church, which must mean he prayed in the Spirit all the time. When I say all the time, much of the time. Another thing, if you're going to interpret this chapter, we said you better see what Paul says so you won't misquote him. Secondly, you need to know, and some probably don't know it because we keep getting additions to the body here, that if your Bible, verse 2, has italics before the word tongues, the word unknown, that means it was added by the non-charismatic translators of the Greek. It's not in the Greek. We should be careful to remember that it's not there. Because if the commentators, the writers of the books, and the King James translators, and I don't know what version you've got where they've bothered to correct that, if they had bothered to read the book of Acts, especially chapter 2, they wouldn't have made such a blunder and put unknown in there. Because they're not unknown tongues or languages. We read in Acts 2, when they received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, they all began to speak in other tongues or languages. The Greek word means languages, like the English tongue. Nothing wrong with that. You understand what we mean, English language. They began to speak in all these languages, and they said, What meaneth this? That we hear every man speaking in our own languages. Now, if you don't know that's there or forgotten it, go back and read Acts 2. I don't think we need to digress to prove that. We've talked too long on the gifts and baptism. But it's there that they were understanding what they were saying. So they're not unknown. They should have just bothered to have read the book of Acts. We've recognized that that is people in this body, myself included, have recognized various languages over the years. I'm sure all of that is on the tapes, the gifts of the Spirit. But I personally recognize Hebrew on more than one occasion, Greek, German, English. Now you may think that's funny, but when I was in Italy, I laid hands on a man. There were several at the altar to receive the baptism. Second one I laid hands on, said, receive the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Perfect English. Well, you say, how do you know he didn't speak English? Well, I guess I don't know in that case. The others I said, like, do you speak German? And when a woman who couldn't speak really good English began to speak Hebrew fluently, beautiful Hebrew, I didn't have to ask her, are you Jewish or do you speak Hebrew? I knew that was the language of tongue she got. But if you're in Italy, and you're speaking from the pulpit and you have to have an interpreter there to the Italians and he tells them, you know, come for the baptism of the Holy Spirit and I got down and some of the others with me and we began to pray. Now you hear others speaking in tongues but you don't know what it is. But when you hear the second one start praising God in English, hallelujah, praise the Lord and so on, you assume that his language was English. Now that isn't anything new because that's happened many times, like in Africa and other places where they couldn't speak a word of English. But turn the thing around. Here's an Italian up here and we're interpreting for him. To the people, I speak Italian. Here's an Italian, he's preaching. and All of you understand English, but you don't understand the Italian. Then we ask some of you to come for the baptism of the Holy Spirit who need it. Second one I pray for starts speaking in perfect Italian. 
I don't say, do you speak Italian? Was your mama a pizza maker? You just assume that John Doe, who works in the factory over here, his language is Italian, you know, the language God gave him. So anyway, it's all on those other tapes, and I won't digress. But these are languages, as we said, and they've been recognized. In verses 6 to 11, he gives us an analogy. An analogy where he shows us that even inanimate objects, such as musical instruments or a trumpet of war, the instruments must speak in such a way they're understood our people can't respond to the instrument. They can't enjoy it, or if it's a battle trumpet, they wouldn't know to go into battle. Verses 6 to 11. He gives us an analogy of instruments, how they must speak clearly, so we must speak clearly. Either the language they understand or tongues with interpretation. Now, brethren, if I come to you speaking with tongues, what shall a prophet you except I speak to you either by revelation, knowledge, prophesying, or doctrine, teaching? Which are other ways of speaking? See, I told you that he deals with more than one kind of speaking. And even things without life-giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sounds, how shall it be known what is piped or harped? For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to the battle? So likewise ye, except you utter by the tongue words easy to be understood, how shall it be known what is spoken? For you shall speak into the air. That's what tongues without interpretation is. For our benefit, you're speaking into the air, but you're getting edified, verse 4. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without significance. But, or therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto him that speaketh. Well, a barbarian, he means one that doesn't speak your language, and he that speaks to me will be like a stranger, a foreigner. You know, that's what he means by barbarian, just someone that is a foreigner who speaks a language you don't understand. So even instruments must speak clearly. You know, the trumpet that calls people into battle the bugler does blow a retreat, and a bugler does blow a move into battle back in the days of the cavalry when they used to be mounted in the bugler. And what if he blew taps when he really wanted to charge into battle against the enemy? Everybody would say, you know, wow, that's nice. I was getting a little tired anyway, and so they lie down on their commander. Or compare the ear-shattering noise of rock and roll music with its disharmony, its offbeat noting, discords, bending notes until you go out of one register into another key. And oh, that noise. Compare that with singing in the Spirit here when we're all anointed together. Even though that case we don't know what we're praying, we're praying and singing mysteries to God. Nevertheless, the sounds, though, tell you you're communicating with God up there, and the other sound tells us they're communicating with the pit, because that music is right out of the pit. I call it pit music. <laughs> Compare a child, four-year-old child, one of those little tin horns that you give him, and then a minute later regret ever having <laughs> Compare that with your well-trained, disciplined bugler who can just, by changing notes a little with his lips, he's able to have you charge or retreat or taps, go to sleep or whatever. Do they have one for meals, you former army people? I don't know, but it has to blow a certain sound. That's what he says there, the analogy. Now, he mentioned several methods of speaking whereby we can be edified, and one is Revelation, verse 6. Now that can be vision, dream, audible voice from the Lord, a revelation 
that's not just an apostolic experience because that's promised the church. He promises over in chapter 12, revelation, word of knowledge and so on, word of wisdom. Joel 2 prophesied that in the latter days when this outpouring that we have experienced happens, your sons and daughters will prophesy, old men dream dreams, and young men have visions. And so this is a method of communication in the church that over in verse 26, he mentions it again, that it's to be done in order. But he's showing here, how can you profit unless I bring you a revelation? There's hardly a service goes by here that someone doesn't share a revelation that they receive from the Lord to edify and bless the body. Then he says, by knowledge, doubtless word of knowledge, not facts in your head you've learned, because he goes on to speak of teaching, right? The last thing, doctrine doctrine or teaching the same word by prophesying and by teaching. Now thirdly in verses 12 to 20 he says our zeal for spiritual gifts should be based upon the right motive. What's the motive? That it edifies the church. 12 to 20. Even so ye for as much as you are zealous of spiritual gifts Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Now, we've already mentioned that. Seek to excel in your gift in the body. Whatever it is. Word of knowledge to gift of healing. Wherefore, let him that speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. That way you can excel. Why just settle for the gift of divers tongues? Pray for the gift of interpretation to go with it. But when I first received the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I found it was a whole lot easier to speak to the church in tongues and let somebody else interpret. Didn't take that much faith to speak in tongues, to bring forth that utterance. You'd be anointed to do it. Now, Lord, I hope somebody here can interpret that. <laughs> well, praise the Lord. I just started believing for interpretation right from the beginning and began to exercise that gift by faith. And so the Lord confirmed it to me. But seek to excel. If it's tongues, then don't stop with tongues. It has a companion gift. Verse 14, If I pray in a tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. What then? I will pray with the spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing in the spirit. I will sing with the understanding. Non-charismatic writers, take note. There's another reason why you ought to say what Paul says. He doesn't say understanding is much more fruitful and profitable when you sing and pray. He says, thank God I can do both. Non-charismatics can't do both. In fact, I'll just go on to add that if you get the experience, you'll find out that praying in the Spirit will be more effective generally than praying with the understanding. Now, there's a place for both, and I do both. That's what he says. Well, he said, if you're just going to speak in tongues, else when thou shalt bless with the Spirit... Let's say, bless a person, bless the food. How shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say amen at the giving of thanks, seeing he understands not what thou sayest? So you can say what is called grace. You can bless the food or say grace in tongues. Praise the Lord. If you're by yourself, I encourage you to try it sometime. Be a real blessing. But if brother, sister, or an unlearned person especially, you know, unlearned in the deeper spiritual things, maybe they got saved and that's about as far as they've gone. And all gathered around the table, families in, they're all Christians. And, well, brother over here, will you give thanks? But he's charismatic. He says, O parase masha le kupo sidi, subrayanda sha salot koya, bosadar bombra tiki kamahaya, zebraya kamasi yalatai. He may go on five minutes. Then he stops in Jesus' name. Until he said that, they didn't even know to say amen. He'd already said it in tongues. Well, you can do that, but then if you're going to do that in public meal services, <laughs> restaurant or whatever, then before you lose your audience, give the interpretation. 
Now he said that, said you can do that. But if you're with others, how will they know when to say amen? For thou verily give us thanks. Now how about that? He says you are giving thanks well, but the other isn't edified. He's waiting to hear about, Lord, bless that food to the nourishment of my body. That, that's a good old stereotype phrase. I step on anybody's toes. <laughs> but anyway, they're waiting for all those familiar phrases. Lord, we thank you for these provisions. We receive them from thy hands. And they don't hear any of that. They just hear this language or whatever. They don't understand. Well, he says... I thank my God I speak in tongues more than you all. By the way, let's keep that in mind. Yet in the church, I would rather speak five words with my understanding so others can be edified, that I might teach them also, than 10,000 words in a language they don't understand one word of said. Now, see, he isn't demeaning tongues. He's said all those other things. In fact, you should never let anybody quote you verse 19 without them quoting also 18 with it. Because 18 helps you to understand what he's saying in 19. I thank God I speak in tongues more than you all. But if I want to communicate something from the Lord to you, I'd rather speak five words in the language you understand than 10,000 words or 50,000. If you don't understand one of them, you've wasted your time. But he said, you're thanking God, but the other isn't edified. Let's say what Paul said. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit be ye children in malice, but in understanding be men. Well, two quick ways you can test whether your motives are right or not. We said our zeal for spiritual gifts should be based on the right motive. How do you know if your motive's right? Two ways. You will be seeking to excel in your gift. Not just so that you can be the best prophet or prophetess or tongues with interpretation. But your motive is going to be you want to excel so you can edify the body. Now edify, you know what it means to strengthen, to build up, encourage. You're going to seek to excel, verse 12. Seek that you may excel to the edifying of the church. Second way you will know that your motive's right in seeking spiritual gifts, you will accept the responsibility that goes with the gift. In the case of tongues, you'll accept the responsibility of making sure there's an interpreter or you will interpret. You see, your motive's right when you want to edify the church by speaking to them in such a way they'll understand what God is saying through you in the tongues. Therefore, interpretation has to go with it. Verse 13. If you speak in tongues, pray that you may interpret. Now you'll hear people say, but I don't have the gift of interpretation. I've tried and it's not there. Well then, verse 28 would apply. In the church it would apply. If there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. Now that's your responsibility. And yet I dare say many. Now, praise the Lord, that isn't true here anymore. It used to be true here. I don't generally hear someone speaking in tongues and waiting and waiting for someone else to interpret. But many, many never seek to interpret. They just burst out in tongues and wait on someone else. And if no one else speaks, there's no interpretation, which violates what he just said. You should have spoken to yourself and God. It's your responsibility to know their interpreters in the meeting where you are. And if they don't interpret, and they don't have to, for you to interpret. Let him that speaks in a tongue pray that he may interpret. Just one example, I was in a meeting years ago where I used to teach every week. There was a sister who every week spoke in tongues, beautiful tongues, never would interpret. Generally, no one else would. And so I, as the teacher, I ended up interpreting. 
And so I was impressed that the Lord was going to have her interpret or be quiet. And I wasn't going to. I knew that before she ever spoke. So here it came forth. We waited and everyone, you know, figured I would. And we waited and we waited. No one else bothered to interpret. I don't know if there was another interpreter there. So I said very quietly and kindly and lovingly, according to 1 Corinthians 14, 13, let him or her that speaks in a tongue pray that he or she may interpret. Now I said, generally, in fact, always you wait for me or someone else to interpret. But this says that you should pray for the interpretation. Now I said, no pressure, no problems. All of our heads were bowed. I said, why don't you just ask the Lord for the interpretation? Let's just wait. It got real quiet. <laughs> but I'll tell you, I don't think it was a minute until she came forth with a beautiful interpretation. No problems after that. It just never occurred to her to read and obey chapter 14. So we can't assume because you got the baptism you've ever read chapter 14, except maybe you were passing through because you're reading the whole New Testament. Well, let's come on to another section. Verses 21 to 25. Now here he speaks of the value and use of uninterpreted tongues. Uninterpreted tongues. It'll be self-explanatory when we get into it. That there's a time to have interpretation and a time not. We never hear this out of our writers, non-charismatic writers and commentators. They always insist that there has to be interpretation. They're trying every way they can to demean speaking in tongues. You see, if there would be a visitor, non-charismatic visitor, they know enough. And I don't mean this is put down to any visitor. But generally, they know enough about chapter 14 to wonder why I didn't interpret when I just spoke in tongues a while ago. If you have the experience, you'll know I interpreted before I gave it. The interpretation preceded. Now, if you don't know what that is, that's why you should get the tape and go back and learn. But we're even taught their times. No interpretation should be given. Well, anyway, let's read it and then you'll see that. 21 to 25. In the law it is written, with men of other tongues and lips I will speak to this people. Now, how about that? In Isaiah, he's quoting from... And by the way, notice he calls it the law. The whole Old Testament was the law, referred to as the law, except when they were being specific. With men of other tongues and lips I will speak to this people, and yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying is not for them that believe not, but for them which believe. Now, he's got other things to say here, so the commentators usually say, see, tongues are only for a sign. So why do they speak in tongues in the church? He just said there, they should be prophesying. You don't have to go through a long dialogue, just say, do you prophesy in your church? That generally stops 99% of them. Say, well, until you prophesy, then you should not be telling me what I ought to do or not to do about chapter 14. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to say more. If therefore the whole church comes together into one place and all speak with tongues without interpretation, of course, and there come in those that are unlearned, you know, just John 3.16 Christians, which most are, or unbelievers, if an unbeliever comes in. See, it's not a place for unbelievers. But if the unlearned and unbelieving come in and hear you speaking in tongues and give no interpretation, won't they say that you're mad? Yes. They do already, don't they? But if all prophesy, and there come in one that believeth not, or one who is unlearned, he is convinced of all, he's judged by all, and thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest, so that falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. Now, friends, he's just giving another illustration of how uninterpreted tongues won't help anything. That uninterpreted tongues are a sign. But you can't apply that to every time uninterpreted tongues come forth, that it was a sign to a person who spoke that language. We'll get into it 
in a moment, but he's showing how that we've got to speak in such a way that if an unlearned or a non-charismatic is all he's talking about, and an unbeliever, if they come into the service. You notice it's an if both times. I don't want to digress there. We're not supposed to have a church filled with non-charismatic, unbelieving people. Hello, two amens on that. Well, I figured I could at least get 50, but that's all in the book entitled Charismatic Body Ministry. The church is not a place to evangelize people, but to teach the saints of God who are gathered to worship God and learn his word, and they go out and evangelize. So that's why he says, if they come in. See, it's an exception. And yet in most churches, they're evangelizing three times a week. Well, as I said, it's in the book. But if all prophesy, he says the secrets of their heart are revealed. Well, not just because they hear a prophecy like we generally hear here, and I'm not putting that down, because you can have the gift of prophecy and still not be addressing yourself to an unlearned or let's say two unbelievers came in and they heard you speaking in tongues without interpretation they'll say what's going on here mad and out they go but if under the anointing of prophecy God says and there are people who have come tonight their hearts are seeking the truth and I want them to know that I know who they are two men who have been searching whether or not Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior and all of this charismatic outpouring is valid and so on. And you go on and on like that. Those men, they mean well, but they have accused my ministry falsely and they have come close to blaspheming me with their remarks about the Holy Spirit. Well, the first thing you know, they may be on their faces if they're sincere. But see, how often is that going to happen? So he's not setting up here, you know, some rule that tongues have to have interpretation every time because an unbeliever might have sneaked in or... Well, there are unbelievers who do get in. I saw one Sunday night. So we know it does happen. So what we're saying at this point is that the apostle has already shown us in verse 2 and 4 and 14 and 15 that the personal use of uninterpreted tongues is for prayer in the Spirit, personal edification. You edify yourself. You don't interpret to yourself, and we know that occasionally you have and can, but that's not the point. That's, again, an exception. So he's shown us that one use of uninterpreted tongues is for personal edification. Your devotional tongues, prayer in the Spirit to God, where you speak mysteries. Secondly, he's showing us here that tongues with interpretation will edify the church. Now, we already know those two things, but here... He's showing us that in addition to these two uses of speaking in tongues, one without and one with interpretation, there is also a use of the uninterpreted tongues spoken in the language the unbeliever speaks. Now, you see, that qualifies it right there. Spoken in the language the unbeliever speaks. And that is a sign to him because God is directly addressing him in his language. And generally it's pretty specific. Or if it's a group of people that need to be saved, it would be specific enough that they know it's God speaking through that person. Now you say, do you have any examples where uninterpreted tongues are used in the Bible to back that up? Now we've got them in experience. Oh, just numerous occasions. Now, it's the exception, of course, but numerous occasions over the years where uninterpreted tongues, God spoke directly to a person in his language through someone who didn't speak the language, through supernatural mm -hmm. tongues, and convicted them of their sins. But what about uninterpreted tongues in the Bible? Well, sure. Well, that's what Acts 2 is. They received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. They all began to speak in tongues as the Spirit gave them the words to utter. And all of those thousands of Jews said, What meaneth this? We hear them, every one of us, hear them speaking in our own languages. Now, Peter, an unlearned fisherman, didn't know all those languages. And as a result of that sign use of tongues without interpretation. See, there's no interpretation there. As a result of that sign use of tongues without interpretation, 3,000 were converted. 3,000. That got their attention, friends. 
So there's a case right in the Bible, the day of Pentecost. People tend to overlook the obvious trying to find some answer to the critics. I remember when I was searching about the truth and reality of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I got a hold of that book, John Sherrill's book. Of course, he was just an investigative reporter and he heard them all singing in the Spirit together. That really got to him, he said, because he knew that wasn't made up. I think it was a full gospel businessmen meeting, about 5,000 lifting up their voice in unison, all singing in various languages in the Spirit, perfect harmony. But another thing that I remembered, he said that in one of the meetings where I believe the meeting was upstairs and the Jewish convert tells what happened later and Cheryl reports it, how as he came up the stairs, he had come to that meeting, you know, to be critical and all of that. And I believe even, you know, to try to disrupt it. At the top stairs, about 11 or 12 year old girl, Gentile if you please, pointed her finger at him as he came upstairs <laughs> and spoke in tongues to him. All she knew, she was anointed to speak to him in tongues, and she let him have it. <laughs> no interpretation went on. And him telling about it later, he said, as I came up those stairs, she addressed me in Hebrew, perfect Hebrew, gave me my name, my address, and told me what I'd come there to do, and I better repent and get right with God. Now, you can look up the details in the book. I'm recalling from way back in 1966, but essentially that's what happened. You didn't need interpretation because that was a sign use of the tongues in the language he spoke. Now, of course, not everyone has a second language, so you can't use the sign gift use of tongues where, like in America, most people speak one language. You don't have a second language. And so you need interpretation. Speak in tongues and interpreter. You don't know what they've said. We've got some people here from Germany and Switzerland and if God wanted to speak directly through one of you to them for whatever reason, it may be for edification and comfort. You know, it's not always better get saved. They would just speak in Deutsch to them and they wouldn't know a word they said, but they would and it would be a direct sign to them about something. Oh, that's happened so much. I think it's on our other tapes, but this was out of the Brethren Church where one brother who got the baptism was invited to speak in this particular Brethren Church. And in the middle of his sermon, he burst out in tongues and didn't interpret. And he was anointed to do it, and he did it. Don't try this or it won't work. They'll throw you out on your ear. But he went on and finished the sermon. And he didn't know why he did that. But after, a woman from India came up and said, I've been praying, I think she said, about three matters, very serious matters, for God to show me what to do. And said, you stop in the middle of the sermon, and in the language I speak, you answered all three of those things. And then went on preaching your sermon. And I've told you about Dad Humbert where couldn't speak good English. And right in the middle of his sermon down in Louisiana or somewhere, French speaking background, burst out in tongues, didn't interpret, went right on. And then they came forward, you know, after the message. And I believe a number got saved and said he can't even speak good English. But he spoke in perfect French to us, admonishing us to get right with God. So these are uninterpreted tongues. No, you won't always interpret. But you let the Spirit lead you. And so what I'm saying is you can't take chapter 14 as non-charismatics do, and I guess most charismatics, and bind God. That Jew would have never gotten saved. You see, if that girl had to interpret when she spoke. Many examples, I'm sure, on the gifts of the Spirit tapes. Well, two reasons why uninterpreted tongues in the public meeting do not have the value of prophecy, and that's why he stresses prophecy. Let me give you two reasons why uninterpreted tongues generally would have no value in a public meeting. First of all, according to verse 22, it would be unnecessary for a Christian. I mean, why the sign use of tongue to a Christian that the gospel is true when he's already believed the gospel? You're just wasting your time. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to those of us who believe, but to those who believe not. But prophesying is for us who believe. Now, you see, that's not an absolute, as we spent about ten minutes showing you. But generally, that's going to be true. But sometimes, uninterpreted tongues can be a sign, you see, to others. Not always unsaved, but like that woman from India. Secondly, the reason uninterpreted tongues 
do not have the value generally of prophecy is because it would be unavailing for the non-Christian. Unnecessary for the Christian, unavailing for the non-Christian. Verses 23 to 25, where we've already covered it. If you speak in tongues, an unbeliever, unlearned comes in and they don't understand what you're saying. They'll say you're mad, but if you prophesy, and that would be implied you understand it was a type prophecy that would really be directed to them in such a way that they'd know God speaking through you, then they would fall on their face and repent. But if you just give them tongues without interpretation, it would be unavailing. To use our example, we've got people here in this body from Germany, Switzerland. What if one of the brothers got up here and preached us a nice hour-long sermon in German? Very few of you would understand it. I'd catch a phrase occasionally because I had to study enough German to pass an exam, but that's been years ago and I never kept up with it. But he surely would be blessed. He would know what he's saying. But he wouldn't edify the rest of us at all, except his marvelous ability to speak all of those guttural sounds that occur in German and get all of his verbs in the right place. Verb goes to the end of the sentence in German, I think. But the point is, you wouldn't be edified. So he would need an interpreter up here or speak in English since they can, and then we'd be edified. So it would be unnecessary for uninterpreted tongues to Christians and unavailing to non-Christians. They wouldn't understand you. The sign use of tongues has its place. God sometimes will address a person. But I failed to add in Acts 2, what got their attention was the uninterpreted tongues in the languages they spoke. But when he preached his sermon, it wasn't in tongues. It was in the language every one of them understood. There was a common language of the world. In that day, it would be Greek. There was also a very common language, Aramaic, the language of trade that everyone spoke. So Peter either preached in Greek or Aramaic, and I see no reason to think it was in Greek, because that's what we have it recorded in. You see, even there, you can't make that an absolute, because sometimes you won't know the tongue you're speaking, but God will preach to others in that tongue. They didn't do that on the day of Pentecost. You have to be careful, you know, that you don't rule out other possibilities. Like in visions beyond the veil, the orphans would go out, you know, that great anointing of the Holy Spirit that fell on that orphanage. They would go out and one would preach in tongues and the other would interpret. And so that's the way they preached. That was one of the ways they preached. And Valdez Jr., whom I've met, he's dead now. I just say that to make a point. It's not something I read out of a book. But just a few years ago, when he was in this area, he said, and he's the one whose dad put water in the Model T and turned it into gas by faith. And his dad walked on air. He didn't have any water to walk on, so he walked on air. Well, that's a whole realm that people today, even charismatics, say, uh-oh, better watch that. But if I explained it all, it wouldn't be as far out as you think. It was the anointing. And he said, I've been talking about, you know, that in these end times, God has shown. And he had a tremendous ministry, so he wasn't talking off the top of his head. But God has shown how some of us are going to be transported here and there. And, of course, shortly after that, those in Indonesia, or about that time, there were transportations in Indonesia. You know, I mean, where a woman was standing on a street corner, and she closed her eyes for a moment and felt the ground quiver a little. She was waiting for the bus, and she found herself in a province there to speak to the people. You need to read about the great outpouring in Indonesia if you don't know those things are happening. In his church, he said, I was also mentioning how God is going to be transporting people all over the world. He said, after a message along that line, he said, one of my deacons came up a little shaky and white, says, Pastor, you've been teaching about how it's going to happen. He says, let me tell you, it's already happening. He said, I went into my bedroom to pray. I knelt down beside my bed, which you better stay shaved up and dressed up. <laughs> and he said, a little quivering at the bedside, and I opened my eyes, and I was in Russia. And for two hours, I preached to them in Russian. Didn't know a word. 
of Russia. They were sitting there. God had them waiting. He was going to send someone to speak to them. Just made his appearance. Remember, Philip got transported, and Elijah, and so on. And Jesus would transport himself when his enemies would surround him. We're just told he just passed through their midst when they were trying to stone him and kill him. Well, anyway, he said, and then I was back in my room. Came on out. Wife said to me, where have you been for two hours? She said, you know, she knew he went into the bedroom to pray and looked in on you. You weren't there. You've been gone somewhere. Of course, he told her. But what I'm saying is <laughs> he preached in a language that he didn't know. So it was speaking in tongues to him. That isn't what they did on the day of Pentecost. So you have to keep a balance on these things, lest some of the skeptics trip you up. That's why we tell you all of these apparent exceptions or asides is because on more than one occasion, like in Indonesia, and here's a case where I know the brother, and happened right in his church. That's right in Milwaukee, friends. That isn't off in China where things like that might happen. That's here. So just be ready. And you won't have to worry about the language. He didn't have a bit of trouble. He knew what he was saying and didn't know a word of the language. Because he was preaching in Russian. He knew what language, where he was, because all of that comes with such an experience, believe me. And he knew what he was preaching, but he couldn't utter a word or a syllable in Russian after the anointing lifted. Well, some regulations. Verses 26 to 40, I'm not going to read all those. I'm going to refer to them and stop there tonight. And the next time we'll deal with the regulation concerning women speaking in the church. But I want to point out to you that the apostle, unlike the non-charismatic writers, is not just regulating or putting regulations in here for speaking in tongues, but verse 26, he's putting regulations in concerning psalms, doctrines, tongues, revelations, interpretations. Verses 27, 28, tongues with interpretation. He's regulating speaking in the church. Verses 29 32, he regulates prophecy, and there's many more regulations for prophecy than for tongues. Much to the chagrin of the demeanors of tongues. That's verses 29 33, prophecy. And then he's talking about speaking in the church, verses 34 and 35. He gives regulations concerning women speaking in the church. See, the whole chapter is dealing with utterance in the church. And if you take that all together, you see that when he gets down to women speaking in the church, that he's not introducing a new subject parenthetically in there. He's still talking about regulations concerning who speaks, when should they speak, and what should they speak. Verse 26, look at it. He deals with many kinds of speaking. How is it, brethren, when you come together, everyone has a psalm, everyone, a doctrine, a tongue, a revelation, interpretation. Let all things be done unto edifying. Now, what's he saying that for? He's saying all of these other things, visions and revelations and psalms that you sing with your guitars and all of that, it has to be done in order to our edification. And seek to excel if you're going to sing to us. <laughs> if you forget half the verses and you get embarrassed, quit. We won't condemn you, but next time, put a notepad up with all it written out, then you won't forget it. I'm saying he said. You see, he's implying here it's to be done orderly, it's to be done by turn, it's to be done in such a way it edifies. Whether you're singing, reciting, a teaching, a tongue, a revelation, a vision, dream, audible voice where the Lord spoke to you, put the pieces together. And I say this to instruct, never to criticize. I've heard testimonies that I've thought, Put it together for us. I think I know what you mean, but you're so blessed, all we're getting is the bubbling over. <laughs> so, you see, he's regulating when you share with us a testimony or whatever. Do it to our edification. And it's not always that way. And again, that's the exception, praise the Lord. Tongues interpretation are regulated, verses 27, 28. 
He says to speak by turn and to give the interpretation. Prophecy, verses 29 33. Now you'll notice prophecy has considerably more regulation than tongues, and yet all we hear about is tongues were causing so many problems they had to be regulated in the church of Corinth. Therefore, let's don't bother with tongues today, let's prophesy. Well, if you're going to follow that line of reasoning, prophecy must have been causing more trouble than tongues because you got more regulations. Now you can read them for yourself. Speak by two or three, verse 29, there's one. Let the other prophets judge, there's another one. Let the other prophets judge the prophecy. I don't see anywhere where he said, judge the tongues and interpretation. Isn't that interesting? But he says for the prophets to judge the prophecies. Interesting. So there's a regulation that tongues doesn't have. Revelation, he says, is take precedence over inspiration. If two or three are waiting to prophesy and while one is speaking by inspiration, a prophet receives a vision, he says that's to take precedence over the one speaking by inspiration because it's a fresh message from the Lord. Right now, a vision. This is what he wants us to know where you can prophesy anytime if you're a prophet. I'm talking about under the anointing. That's by inspiration. But a vision, revelation takes precedence. It says, let the other one hold his peace. Or it can be by turn. There are two or three to prophesy in each service. Just like tongues, limited. And so it's my turn next or your turn. One's prophesying, but while I'm waiting, I get a vision and he doesn't have it. So I'll be next. Doesn't mean you have to interrupt the one who's speaking by inspiration. Now there's a little aside teaching that you probably never thought of. It doesn't mean if one is speaking by inspiration, one said, I've got a vision. Hush, hush, hush. Here's, no. But whoever's turn it is, if one has a vision to relate and the other is going to speak by inspiration, the one with the vision takes precedence and the other holds his peace till he's done. Also, here's another regulation. Prophecy and prophecy also, like tongues, are to be spoken by turn. We're talking about so many regulations here for the same purpose that we'll be edified. Another regulation, verse 32, inspiration doesn't rob anyone of self-control. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Look how many regulations on prophecy. And only one on tongues. Well, two speak by turn and use the companion gift of interpretation. How often have we heard, and we have had it in our experience in this charismatic church, where a person would burst out in tongues interrupting someone else. Or it would be out of order. Let's have a moment of quietness and wait upon the Lord and see what he shows us we should do about this situation. And you wait about 10 seconds and blah de blah de blah Here comes out this loud tongues that really has nothing to do with what you're doing. Or it may just confuse the issue. They say, I was so anointed I just couldn't help myself. That's right, and they didn't help the church either. <laughs> the spirit of the prophets are subject to the prophets. If you can't control yourself, run around the building a couple of times. <laughs> well, the institutional church tells us that tongues cause problems, therefore they had to be regulated. Well, as we've already shown, prophecy has considerably more regulation. Besides that, the Bible is filled with regulations about the way we're to talk, conduct ourselves, and so forth. God doesn't hesitate to regulate us if we want to make it in. And I'll tell you something else. The institutional church who teaches us error concerning chapters 12 to 14, they have their regulations. I mean, they have books full of them. And you better follow them. And as often as not, they're substitutes for God's regulations. So... Enough said. We'll take up concerning the women next time and their speaking. Lord bless you.